Um, this evening, we are very privileged to have Tom Griscom, who represents two worlds. Uh, he worked in the, in the high reaches of the Reagan administration, worked in the, uh, as a communications director, as the communications czar, and also worked in the Senate uh, for Senator Howard Baker, and is the editor and publisher of the Chattanooga Times. So you can really tell us how those two worlds intersect and what some of the pressures are of providing the public with the information that um, they need. In looking at your two positions, did you see information differently and what the public needs for information? Like when you were in the White House, how did you look at that question of what information the public needs and how do you look at it now? I want to I want to reverse your question if you don't mind because sure. one of the anyway. things when I when I uh, when I got back into journalism after I mean, that's where I started when I graduated from college, uh, low many years ago. Uh, to come back into a newsroom uh, with people who had spent most of their time, you know, as journalists. That's what they had done. So they had all, they had a lot more experience mm -hmm. that way than maybe I had in knowing what the latest light, writing style were, things like this. But here's the point I made, Martha, at the time. I said, I wish there were more people in journalism who had done what I did. I mean, I'm a hybrid. I'm, you know, you don't usually find people like me mm -hmm. who are allowed to come back into the fraternity, per se, uh, but I wish I wish there was more uh, people like with the experience that I've I've had, because here's what you bring in, an understanding of how how policy works, how things get done, mm -hmm. uh, the pressures that are applied, uh, the special interests, all the things that that go in, and the fact that journalists get spun just as much as anybody else, they get leveraged by you know a phone mm -hmm. call. Uh, or somebody pushing a, a point of view, and I said, if, I said, if you can understand that, uh, that what happens with the way stories are told, mm -hmm. how you gather information, now you're going to sit there and think that nobody, you know, nobody influences me at all. And I said, let me tell you, I did. Mm -hmm. That used to be what I did. I will come to that in just a second. But I said, so step back and think about this. If you've, you've got a story that, that's being done about, uh, let's say, Bowwater, which is a company that's, that's down in our area, as a paper manufacturer. And so you've got a lot of environmentalists that talk about what bow water does and, you know, in, in clear-cutting things like this. Uh, and so you get this information, and, and your, your natural tendency is you're going to run with that without checking the facts. And you're not going to necessarily tell readers, who is this group that's put out this information? Who funds them? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the agenda that they have? I said, that's... You ought to be just as focused on telling that part of the story. Let readers decide then, after they know, here's who this, this group is, mm -hmm. here's what Bowwaters does as a company, put all that information out there, because that is part of telling this story. I said, now, it's not that I'm so, so smart myself, but it's part of having watched how decisions get made, the influences come to bear as, you know, as a, mm -hmm. a, you know, a White House or a Congress gets ready to act on something. Shouldn't you be telling the whole story? And, and part of that, I said, comes from the experience that I had in government. Uh, now, when you go back then, now let me take the first part of your question. I think the most difficult part, and one of the things that we were talking about briefly uh, with Tony Snow getting ready to come in as the new spokesman at the White House, is you have to understand there is a very, it's a very different world when you're a reporter looking in and when you're a spokesperson looking out. Mm -hmm. And some of the very same people that Tony Snow has worked with, you know, as a commentator, uh, at Fox News are now adversaries, not necessarily in a bad sense, but they're out trying to tell stories. Mm -hmm. uh, and so relationships change. Mm -hmm. uh, and what a Tony Snow is trying to do is to, you know, is, is to take a set of facts and present them from administration's point of view. You're an advocate now. Uh, you know, you, you've, got a, you've got to sort of take a, a set of situations and try to pitch them as best you can. And the balance that he's got now, I think any good press secretary's got to understand, or a communication person who, mm -hmm. you know, inside a White House, is where does your credibility start and stop? Yeah. I mean, we went in during Iran-Contra, and we had some clear understandings of, of, of would we ever go to a point where you knowingly told a lie? And the answer was no. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's why today, you know, you know I, I consider today, and you and I have had this conversation before, and say at no point uh, in my career, which was, as you said, was in the, in the Senate and then in the White House, did I knowingly put out information that was not credible <clears throat> or was not factual. Uh, and because at the end of the day, all you have is really your own, your own reputation. Right. And whether that matters or not, it should. And then you have to decide if it gets to the point of whether, you know, if you know there's information you've been given that's not accurate, do you put it out or do you say, I can't do that? Because then you have a choice. And I think the choice isn't that you go out and scream and get yourself in the media. The choice is that you decide that, you know, I'm going to go do something else. Uh, you know, but just because I, I, you know, I can't uh -huh. deal with that, I'm not going to put out something I know is false. But what responsibilities do you, do, do you have, as, say, as a communications director or as a press secretary, to dig down and find out what the facts are? Because it's very difficult to do. You just, you know, if you talk to a public affairs person, which, you know, they have regular calls with public affairs people, and they're going to always give the rosy picture. Right. And so how do you dig into the bureaucracy and make sure that you're getting what you need to get? Well, that is hard because if you're in the White House, I mean, I watched the, the, the story developed about, the, uh, uh, about turning over the ports uh, right. and the port security yeah. to, to uh, you know, a company in Dubai. And uh, I kept waiting for somebody in right. the White House to say it was vetted, but if it, if it, there are so many different interagencies that touch a, a decision, and what it says is that the White House staff didn't function. Right. Because there is a coordinating you know, position inside the White House where all this comes together. Uh, it does rise to the top because here's the President of the United States, you expect that he will know. Uh, but there are so many different people and players that uh, if you're, I mean, what it told me was that the, that the way the White House was set up to operate, there was, you know, there were a couple missing pieces. So you needed to, you know, somebody needed to come in and sort of look at that and decide at the end of the day, you know, you could at least say that, that there was an awareness inside the White House before that decision yeah. got made. Because we just had, you know, a, a decision, what, within the last week where this time the president actually looked at. So somebody yeah. got the message uh, that you, you have to be able, you know, and because in, in our, in the White House when we were in there, there was a staff secretary, and that was staff, staff secretary's job, move paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was, there was paper that got moved that got to, you know, to a certain level where within the White House you knew what was going on. And, uh, and but that was one of the breakdowns that I saw. Yeah, uh, was right. that that there, there were some things just really not functioning. And it isn't a matter of of what I'll call of control. It's a matter of needing to know uh, and making sure that that you know as a decision like this, which is a fairly uh, sensitive decision, had a lot of of, of uh, you know, potential security you know ramifications, but also had a congressional you know a real congressional. Sure. Uh, piece to it yeah. uh, that, that the systems had broken down. Yeah. Um, I kind of wonder if, if one of the things that, um, that was at the back of it, in this administration, the system that CARD uh, wanted to set up was a compartmentalized system where everybody had their job, that they would have a responsibility to do, to do X and Y. And so they took care of that particular part. Right. But that the integration of all of it was... Um, uh, was lacking in, in some times. Uh, because there were times, for example, when, um, when you'd have um, an economist uh, come out and say, uh, like the, um, uh, the guy who was the Council of Economic Advisors, head of the Council of Economic Advisors, who was saying that um, outsourcing really you know, worked pretty well. And so that report, I mean, you could say, <laughs> you probably have to rephrase that. And uh, right. so say in the Clinton administration, you had, <clears throat> as I guess most Democratic administrations, a lot of redundancy. I mean, you just had so many people involved in everything. But the result of it was that, um, that people had a little more political sensitivity of when they were going to run into trouble. And so the economic reports were always run through them. Uh, yeah, it, it, but you know, for an for an administration that really has has tried to sort of clamp down on on who can speak and and leaks and things like this, uh, for it to have had as many you know <clears throat> sort of what I'll call bumbling episodes, 
uh, you want to ask the question, were you so focused on, on shutting off the spigot that you didn't worry about just the basics of how information gets, you know, gets disseminated? Right. I mean, when, when, when we went inside the, the Reagan White House, uh, you know, it wasn't that, <clears throat> that, that things were out of control necessarily. Uh, it, was un it was really making sure that things were vetted and that you, there was some idea of what was getting ready to happen, when it was getting ready to happen, uh, and being able to, to manage that information flow. Uh, I mean, we, we, you know, we've talked about before that when we went in and, and that at, then, you know, uh, Chief of Staff Don Regan had said his mission was to let President Reagan be President Reagan, mm -hmm. uh, which meant just whatever he wanted to say and do, let him go do it, when in effect, if you really understood President Reagan, that, uh, <clears throat> that the White House had been set up, even his governor's office in California was set up uh, the same way that he had been as an mm -hmm. actor. That here was his role, but he had always had people around him who, you know, who who were there to right. manage you know, things, you know, whether it was scripting or things like this. Uh, and when you took those away, that all of a sudden what happened is that you had similar to what I think we've seen a little bit in this in this White House mm -hmm. is things just sort of happening out here without somebody really understanding how to manage them, how to make sure it was all came you know came together, yeah. uh -huh. uh, and that you had a focus a focal point uh, on what you were doing. Um, and, and, and that to me is what was surprising, Martha, to watch a lot of what was happening here. I think you, uh -huh. I think you have, the way you describe what Andy Card was doing, he's a uh -huh. great guy, mm -hmm. really, really a, a, a really good person. But, uh, uh, but a White House staff is designed to make sure that there's no surprises. Yeah, I mean that's that was one of Senator Baker's rules from the beginning when we went to work with him. No surprises. You go have a latitude to do a lot of things, but at the end of the day, make sure uh -huh. that I'm not that there's not a surprise because something just fell through the cracks. Do you think that um, that there is an inherent problem when you're very focused on a message, and everybody's got their responsibilities uh, relating to that message and taking it out, that it becomes difficult to listen? Well, I, I'm not sure this administration has been that much focused on a message. I mean, there have been times, and I'm looking at it now as an outsider's newspaper you know, editor and publisher, of where you scratch your head trying to figure out, well, what are they really, what are they really doing this week? Uh, I mean, when the whole, you know, when, when Congress and the country moved off of Social Security and they still had the president out there talking about privatizing Social Security. Mm -hmm. Now, if I was going to be, still have that message, we just had a, a, a report that just came out earlier this week about Medicare and Social Security still being on path to go bankrupt by, what, 2040. Uh -huh. Well, if, I, if that issue was important, then mm -hmm. that would be the time I'd be out there talking about it because you've got a hook to build it off of. But, but it's, it, was, it was watching it sort of getting a sense that was there really, was there really a message or were they just sort of out there you know, putting things up against the wall, uh, you know, and trying just to sort of go uh -huh. back to some some consistent themes, but themes that had that had so far passed on, you know, on right. through that you, yeah. know, you just wondered, you know, was there was there a real focus on this message? Right. I, I'm not sure. Because um, as they began, they talked about one, Social Security was in trouble, mm -hmm. and number two they thought that the, um, the retirement accounts would be a good idea. And the two, I mean, right from the start in the briefing room, reporters uh, pointed out that one didn't relate to the other. Right. And how, how can you sell these two things together? And, um, and they just hung with it no matter what. And if you look at the polls, that the support for it was less. I mean, it was 60, 60 cities in 60 days. Well, it was kind of like 600 cities because uh, they right. s sent out so many people. But by the end, the support was less than when they began. Well, and, and you know, we, we were talking you know, earlier about uh, making sure that people inside a newsroom understand context and history. Uh, this administration is in the middle of a war. And we really haven't had a country in the middle of a war. I mean, the, the skirmishes that went on with the Reagan administration, things like this, that's what they were. But we haven't been at war since Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was fascinating inside my newsroom to look at young people 
for the first time in, what, 30 years, who were all of a sudden, uh, you know, talking about their colleagues, their friends in college who had gotten into the National Guard as a way to pay, pay their way through right. college. Now yeah. all of a sudden, yeah. my gosh, they're getting called up. They had never in their wildest dreams ever thought that they yeah. would actually serve. And uh, we had this, we, we, when, 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 when the Iraq War was getting ready to start, we had a, a meeting uh, of our news staff and uh, to talk about covering a war. I mean, we did embed a reporter in Iraq for six months. But just some of the stories and things you're going to do as a, as uh -huh. a startup with reporters who knew nothing about the, the various branches of government and the difference in, in, in insignias and ranks among the various branches. So we had this conversation. This is a room with about 50 people in it, and there were three people in that room, including myself, who'd ever served in the military. Mm. Now, and I've got a room full of baby boomers, like most newspapers are going to have. And then you sort of bring it back from that. And I was startled to realize that in this room that I've got people who are getting ready to cover something, most of whom have no context for any, you know, understanding the military, how it works, yeah. uh, these type things. So you, you take that and then say, all right, here's an administration now that is in the middle of trying to steer and direct a policy at the time we're back at war. And you want to say, I wonder if they spent any time understanding, mm -hmm. going back and looking at what was happening during the Kennedy administration, mm -hmm. Johnson, uh, Nixon, a country at war. What was different? Could you get people focused on other things than worrying about you know, what's uh -huh. going on in that case in Vietnam, now it's worrying about what's going on in Iraq, uh, and how do you yeah. sort of put that in context at the same time you deal with other issues? Now, one of the advantages, this administration right now has got an economy that is doing pretty well if you take the gas piece out. Mm -hmm. But if you look at their numbers, their numbers are in the tank. Yeah. And partly because I don't think they really have been able to understand how to talk about the war in Iraq and to sort of bring a focus to it uh, at the same time that they're trying to push. I mean, it seemed like such a, a separation. Say, I'm going to go out and talk about Social Security reform at the time that you're fighting a war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was sort of like this just gigantic disconnect. Do you think part of it, too, is that the White Houses reflect a president rather than complement it? That no matter how many people he hires, it, those people are going to reflect his strengths. So say in, um, in Reagan's case, you all had a really strong communications operation, and it was just state of the art. But then when uh, Bush came in, um, uh, George H.W. Bush came in, he was not interested in communications and he let all of that go. He didn't even talk to the people about staying on because he didn't, he wasn't interested in that. So he didn't have an operation like that. He had a press operation in Marlin was great, but it really was just a press operation, give out the uh, information rather than do, do the other. And that in this administration, while the president is interested in the whole concept of, uh, of communications, his idea is you make decisions and you tell people what the decisions are. You don't go through explaining what were the alternatives, what was the problem, how did you get there. And if the president's not going to do that, he has a staff that reflects that as well, that they can't be better in that than he can. No, I think you're right. I mean, one of, the, one of the first things Senator Baker said when he went as chief of staff for President Reagan, he said people need to understand you know, that Ronald Reagan is president, I am not. Uh, and, and that was important because at the time that, that, that Senator Baker went in, uh, President Reagan had had surgery, ran contra had happened, he had been out of the public eye for months. And his former colleagues on uh, Capitol Hill in the Senate uh, were, were thinking that, well, Senator Baker was going to come in and he's basically going to be the de facto president. Because uh, President Reagan had vetoed a highway bill. I mean, we're we're talking about pork today. I mean, come on. I mean, again, I go back to context. I mean, here was a highway bill that was just chock full of stuff. President Reagan had vetoed it, somewhat symbolically. And and Senator Baker's former colleague said, "We know that when he gets there, he is going to convince the president that this is a bad idea, uh, and 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 that everything will be okay." Well, it didn't happen. They overrode the veto. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and it was about as negative a reaction to Senator Baker as you know, as you could imagine, because his former colleague said, "Well, Don Regan would have been better than this," and that's when <laughs> Senator Baker said, "We well, have to realize he is president, I am not," mm -hmm. uh, and I think and that's to your earlier point. You 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 know there is this this misconception at times that well the person in the office is sort of you know, is sort of there as a figurehead. Well, no, he's really the President of the United States, and, and, and that's where it all, I mean, it all revolves around that. And you're right. With one, I want to add one piece, though, to your description of what happened with both Bush 41 and Bush 43, is the communications today are so different than when we were there. I mean, we were there in 1987, 1988. Uh, if you look at what has happened with the explosion of the Internet, uh, with the, I mean, communication that is instantaneous. And so therefore, that you don't have, you don't have the same amount of time to sit there and ponder something before it gets picked up and it's moved someplace else. You didn't have bloggers then. You know, mm -hmm. all these people uh, with computers who become overnight experts on whatever topic. And there are people, unfortunately, I will say, who believe you know, what some people will sit down at their little computer and write, whether it has any basis in fact or not. Yeah. But we've allowed that to happen, and we've allowed a lot of that to happen by, uh, by talk radio and mm -hmm. things of that nature. Don't give me I'm a firm believer in free speech. Mm -hmm. But you would like to have, be able to say, yeah, but not all speech is exactly the same, <clears throat> because some people are out yeah. there, yeah, and there's ulterior motives for what they're doing uh, or whatever, but uh, but I don't. I think it is. I think communication has changed so much. The way you get messages out has changed so much uh, that when Ronald Reagan would talk about, as he did, uh, you know, I'm going to go speak directly to the American people. I'm going to bypass Congress because you remember those days mm -hmm. when Tip O'Neill was Speaker of the House and and uh, uh, you know and that he felt like well the House is going to try to block some. So I'm going to bypass all of you all. And I'm going to talk directly to the American people. He would do it. Had a great mechanism set up where they could get a response vehicle that would just flood congressional offices with reaction. Yeah. It was all a political operation. Right. Well, today, if you, you know, I mean, if you say I'm not going to talk to the to the you know <clears throat> to the media, let's you know, let's say to the to the mainstream media. Uh, well, it doesn't really matter because. There's so much you can, you know, there's so many other ways to, to capture events, to have people covering something, to get it out there so quick that, you, you know, you have to have stayed up with that, you know, with the way information gets transmitted. And, you know, it isn't just, you know, it isn't just what is on the networks or the, mm -hmm. the, or the, or the, the New York Times or Washington Post, you know, uh, th this type of media. It is, it is so, so diffuse now that uh, if you don't understand how to work it. I mean, remember the regional news conferences that presidents used to have. I can remember this with President Carter where you'd bring correspondence up <clears throat> from newspapers around right. the country. Yeah. Well, you don't need to do that. I mean, look at what we're doing tonight. Mm -hmm. I mean, a White House today, if they're not sitting down using this kind of technology, which they're not, uh, to, to, to say, I'm going to string together uh, and we're going to bring the President of the United States or these policymakers right into your, into your newsroom. Mm -hmm. We're going to do instantaneous ed boards. Uh, but that's, yeah. how, that's how you take the message and it's how you work it. That's how you sort of get it and I think in touch the kind of people you're trying to reach. But you've got to be willing to understand how information gets out now. And, 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 and you do give up a measure of control, but I'm not sure there's much control left anyway, Arthur, with, with, with how broad the spectrum is that you can you know, communicate. Today. But don't you need that White House press corps? I remember <laughs> I was in uh, College Station, Texas, when uh, the energy plan was, uh, was released. And the article in the College Station Eagle was written by Terry Hunt who is at the White House for Associated Press. And that, uh, and if you look at the blogs, the blogs depend upon uh, newspapers and a lot on what's going on from the White House, you know, if White House reporters writing. And you look at, at cable, you know, where is cable getting its stuff? Right. You know, it's getting it from, uh, from newspapers as well. So newspapers are still very important and the people at the White House are critical. And so you've got to deal with them. You do, except I, I think that the media is going, 
is is going through such a transformation, and we're not sure. I don't think anybody yeah. knows yet where it's going to end up. Um, uh, White House press corps had personality, and characters. I'm not sure the White House press corps today has the same character and personalities. And I think that's a step down. Doesn't mean, I mean uh -huh. you know, <clears throat> the Sam Donaldsons of, of my time mm -hmm. could really get under your skin, but, but, a, but Ronald Reagan used Sam Donaldson as a foil just like Sam Donaldson used him to sort of build his career. There was this give and take and you know, it'd get people angry but but it brought a personality and a sense of character to the press corps. Uh, now it's just, I have to say, it's somewhat bland. And it's not saying they aren't good journalists, uh -huh. but I think, unfortunately, it's reflecting what's going on in the media. Uh, I mean, if you look at, at, at a lot of the network news now, if you look at... Are there real correspondents necessarily on Capitol Hill, or do they more have producers and things? They'll run somebody up there every now and then uh, to cover something. Yeah, it's more of the latter than the former. Mm -hmm. uh, used to, Capitol Hill was the proving ground for somebody to move from there to go to the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's, it's, you know, what you've seen over time is a squeezing out because newscasts have become more entertainment-oriented. Uh, rather than the, than some of that that biting edge, and I think cable has caused part of that. But also, I think some of the other competitors, uh, like Fox, mm -hmm. have forced the other you know, main networks to sort of move and shift direction with a large you know, with with what they do. And and I I, I worry about that because mm -hmm. I think that that uh, you know, that you've got to, the role of the media. Not just the newspapers, but the role of the media is to serve in that watchdog role. Mm -hmm. Is to be willing to ask the questions, uh, be somewhat aggressive at times. You've got to find that boundary line where you where you don't cross over and become rude necessarily, but you can be aggressive yeah. without being rude. But all of a sudden you get uh, you know you get blasted on you know on you know. Uh, by Rush Limbaugh's like this, and you want to say, so what? Mm -hmm. But that takes a little courage to do. I mean, we, we, our our reporter who was embedded in Iraq uh, got involved in a little bit of a of a uh, of a back and forth when the question got asked by a, a National Guard soldier with the oh, 278 right. yes, about <clears throat> about armor on Humvees, and we had done a story. Uh, he'd done several stories prior to Rumsfeld showing up. Uh, and, and coined the phrase hillbilly armor, where some of these, these soldiers went out into scrap heaps, found uh, metal, steel, would cut it out themselves and put it on their Humvees before they were going to get ready, because they were getting ready to be deployed into Iraq. And so the soldier asked the question, our reporter, uh, you know, was, uh, the soldier went to him and said, you know, look at my question, you know, whatever. Uh, we made a mistake, which, which I wrote about in our paper, because we should have, uh, in, in the rush to edit the story, what didn't get put in there because the, one of the editors thought that the reporter was going to put it in, the reporter thought the editor was going to put it in because we're dealing with somebody now in Kuwait, that would have said, here was my role. Mm -hmm. That the soldier came after this, I looked at it, but it was his question. Uh, so anyway, so we, we, we write the story and... You might want to tell them what, what the response was from, from Rumsfeld. It's well, basically, you know, what he said was, you, you you sort of get the uh, I'm trying to remember exactly, but you, you sort of get the go to war with the, uh, with, the with the with with the army with the army with that you, you have. have, not necessarily the, the army, army that, that you, you want. want. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> you know, and so this story happens uh, immediately. There's this bombardment from Rush Limbaugh, and Lee Pitts's father, uh, who's in South Carolina, called me, and he he wanted to he, did, did I know what was you know, what was happening, you know, what was being said. I mean, his son at that point was, was in a convoy going into Iraq, so he had no idea what was happening. And he said, you know, Rush Limbaugh saying all these things, and you know, basically that my son is not patriotic, and he's, and he's saying that if you won't fire him, then you ought to be fired yourself, and, and that you're some East Coast liberal. You know, he's sure you're some East Coast liberal. And I said, well, Mr. Pitts, here's what you ought to do. I said, uh, you know, you ought to send him an email, 
and knowing, I said, don't call him because you'll never get on, but, but know when you send the email, he'll never read it. But tell him who you are and that you've talked to this editor at the Chattanooga newspaper. And as best you can determine from having listened to him, he done like he's from the East Coast. <laughs> and by the way, you might want to know that at one point he was a communication director in the Reagan White House. But I said, don't tell him I work for Howard Baker because that would be, you know, he said, aha, you know, we found the terrible part of it. But I said, this, and then, then there was this campaign, orchestrated campaign that started. Uh, we got over 2,000 emails during this, you know, over about a four or five day period. And the first 500 were all negative. I mean, and these are, are so-called people who would be, you know, identified with the Christian right and all this. Some of the language, Martha, was incredible. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 but I had, you know, I mean, I know how you run these grass top campaigns, it, and I know where it got orchestrated. It came out of a national political committee here in Washington uh, because they weren't smart enough. And I guess they didn't realize that maybe there was somebody on the receiving end, meaning, naming me, naming me, who knows how these things work. But then it turned. I mean, all of a sudden, because real people yeah. then started talking about it. But I also got some calls from people in the media that I'd worked with as a press secretary. And, and, and they had gotten caught up in the Rush Limbaugh line. And I said, you know, time out. I said, let me just tell you something. I said, if you did your research, you would see that we've run several stories on this issue. And yes, I'll acknowledge that we didn't do, you know, we should have put this in the story. But I wrote a front page piece where I, where I said that in front of our newspaper. And I said, but here's the, the real issue in my mind is, is there a little jealousy here? Because here's a newspaper in Chattanooga, Tennessee that's raised this issue, that's got this thing brought back up, and you are the, yeah. quote, national media, and you sort of let this story go away. It is not a news story. It's been out there. It got talked about in the campaign. And I found myself, believe it or not, back in the middle of the, of the bush Kerry political fight it was a red state, blue state issue, basically accusing us of being in the middle of trying to push forward the, you know, the, the Democratic agenda. I said, you know, th that, is, that is so wrong and so wrong-headed that I hope we haven't gotten to that point that, that, that we are, you know, when you raise a legitimate issue yeah. that is being viewed in a partisan prism, uh, and therefore, you don't you don't even have a right to raise it or to think about it. And we're going to we're going to go after the messenger rather than to to talk about the message. Mm -hmm. I mean, is the message right? Do we have do we have troops over there who didn't have the appropriate you know protection as they're getting ready to go into into combat? And the answer was yes. I mean, I share that with you because it, it to me it was a very telling episode. Yeah. But I found a lot of the people who are very respected journalists who fell right into the into the trap yeah. uh, of just sort of me tooism, saying, "No, don't defend me, but be willing. Look at the story, ask the question." Mm -hmm. And I go back. Uh, this is my roundabout way to get into to what you had posed a, a few minutes ago, is that I hope we don't get to the point where we've lost that voice, the characters. The, the willingness to, to be a little more aggressive, and we've lost it because, well, guess what? I may get, may, I may get pounded by, uh, by a Rush Limbaugh type. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I mean, a Fox News may attack me. But if your information is credible, then mm -hmm. stand behind it. Now, if you make gross errors, then, yeah, you ought to be mm -hmm. uh, called to task for it. I mean, I do think there are some, I think there are, have been stories that have been done on some wild allegations got picked up and presented as facts. I think that was very appropriate to do that. But don't, don't become shy mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, you know, you know, because somebody may, you know, may, may raise a question about what I've, what I've written yeah. or said. So do you think that, um, that information is, uh, has increasingly, particularly say from the time that you were in the Reagan White House, that information is no longer neutral? that people tend to look, uh, look at it through their own prison. I think we have, I think, I think as much as we've seen the polarization in the country, red state, blue state, right. I've seen, think we, yes, we've seen the same polarization in the media and trying to beat people down. Uh, I mean, I'm gonna go back to, to our, our embedding reporter in Iraq. Our reporter was there to do one thing, and that was to cover the 278, a 3,000 plus unit uh, National Guard soldiers primarily from Tennessee. That was where he was. He was with them the whole time. We would keep getting stories 
or emails uh, that why won't you all ever write anything good? You know, you know, why don't you tell the real story about what's going on? And there was that there was this email that was cir circled around about every two or three weeks. Of, Here's what's really happening in Iraq. You know, all the good stuff, uh, and it keep getting recycled. Mm -hmm. And I said, if anybody looked at what we were writing, we weren't, you know, we were, didn't have a person in Baghdad. We didn't want that. We, the stories for us to tell, because it's the only place you're going to find these stories were about the troops from Tennessee that had been deployed. Mm -hmm. And we told their stories. And they, they were not, you know, all the same stories, you know, <clears throat> that you're reading, you know, covering the, the broader part of the war. And you, I'd sit there, and, and I'd, I'd write, you know, columns every so often, uh, you know, in response to these these you know uh, you know faceless emails that come in about the the media in this country doesn't tell the real story, it's, then you're not reading what we're writing because he is telling the real story and he's telling it from the from the voices and faces of these soldiers, and it was about going into communities and and working with them to reestablish you know hospitals and things like this. But yeah, I think there is this a little bit mm -hmm. you, you become a little bit gun shy because the polarization that we've seen politically, the polarization that I think exists up on, on Capitol Hill yeah, now, right. you know, has been brought into the media where you basically say, if you don't, if you tell this story, then we're going to, you know, we're going to come after you. We're going, we're going to attack you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I hope, Martha, over time, that, that the media does not you know, fall into the trap where they say, well, therefore, we're going to look the other way. Uh -huh. We're not going to cover that story. Uh, and and you know and and you know and because that if that's what happens then we've you know, we've really made a mistake. Uh, uh, Do you think that's happening at the local level, or is it uh, more at the national level? I think it's more at the national level. Um, I think at the at the at the local level, uh, you know, you you've got. I think you still can see the ability to you know to, to tell the stories <clears throat> because they're closer to home. Mm -hmm. These are people that you know that you live with, you think about, but you don't find the same you know stark contrast that are being. I mean, at, at at my newspaper, we will get a lot of people who will criticize us because we use the New York Times news service. Uh, our newspaper, part of our our merged paper, is where the New York Times started. Adolph Ox started in Chattanooga. So the New York Times news service has been part of the newspaper and will always be. I will get emails saying, well, we're going to stop reading your newspaper because you've got the New York, you use the New York Times news service and we know that they're biased. Mm -hmm. And I say, thank you very much. We're going to keep using it because they're good, they're good journalists. Uh, but it, but and so on national stories, yes. Mm -hmm. But if we do a story, we just had, we had, a, we had an election Tuesday uh, in our community, and a longtime sheriff for 20 years got beat by by somebody in a primary, and you couldn't tell enough of that story. People were interested in it. Mm -hmm. but it's a local election. But if you get to the national piece, then you see, I mean, you know, all of a sudden it, you pick up some of this, you know, some of this overhang that uh, that's out there and that you see, you know, in the in particularly in Washington. Uh, in the Washington community. And uh, we were talking be, uh, before our session began about the concept of convergence and, and right. what is going on in the newsroom today and what you're doing to try to bring a lot of different pieces together. And can, can you talk about it? Because it's one of the, the main things that we've talked about in, uh, in the course of how our newspaper is going to survive. You know, you, you've, you've seen a lot of, of, uh, of growth in major, you know, news organizations, you know, a, a lot of, of family-owned papers that now become part of big chains, and then those big chains, you know, are on, on you know, are publicly held companies, and 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 so you know, you get this, you know, what is your latest quarterly earning? The paper I work for is part of a a seven newspaper chain that's still family-owned, privately held, which is great uh -huh. because you can deal with the cycles, and there are cycles in our industry, just like there are in other industries. Uh, and so we're able to sort of work through that and continue doing the things that we ought to do, which is to offer good, solid journalism every day. The, 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 the part that concerns me more than anything else is, you know, you, we can be doomsayers and we can, we, can, you know, we can predict our own demise by telling people that, we're, that newspapers are dead. Uh, 
uh, or we can say, look, circulation is dropping. We've got to be smart enough to figure out how do we keep doing what we're doing, which is, you know, is, is providing uh, you know, journalism and, and, and covering important stories that people need to know. Uh, and so how do we go do that? How do we keep making sure that we, you know, that we can you know, provide that? Which means you step back and you, you realize that you know, in, in local markets, it's newspapers that drive what people know. So I've got a newsroom you know, that's, that's got journalists in it. And if you start from the premise that if we can't figure out how to provide the income, the profit mm -hmm. stream, that supports those journalists, then what does happen over time is they go away. When they go away, then television can't fill that void. Radio, we, we, we know, do, won't, won't fill that void. So journalism in this country basically diminishes. I do not think that will happen. But I think we've got to be smart enough to understand and be willing to bring inside newsrooms. I mean, Martha, when I came back and I'd spent, you know, I've spent 30 plus years in some type of communication, uh, I spent nine years in a corporate communication job and had done PR, all this stuff. But one of the things in the corporate job that I understood was uh, profit and losses. Mm -hmm. And so when I came back in and said, here's what we're going to talk about. We're, we're going to bring some management tools in. We're going to actually do performance reviews. Mm -hmm. Because people all know how they're doing. They also know what expectations are there. But we're also going to be willing to talk and use the P word. We're going about profits. I mean, first time I raised that in the newsroom, you should have seen people's eyes say, oh, my gosh, you know, they sort of did this. You know, we're, 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 we're writers. We write stories. We get to go home. We don't have to worry about where the money comes from. I said, well, yes, you do. It doesn't mean that you write a story to get an advertisement. We don't do that. But you need to understand good journalism is, can be sold, meaning content sells. You can sell content if you do it right. And so what we then embarked on uh, you know, and really focus on it late last this past year was how do we how do you mm -hmm. sort of reconfigure what we do, which is produce content. The traditional model, if you know, as newspapers is uh, here's here's a newsroom. You put put out a print product, and then everything else falls off the print product because we know that radio and TV steals our stories. It makes us angry every day because mm -hmm. we do all this hard work, and they read it like they had been doing all this work. And so we're going to show them. We're just going to sort of hang on to it, and, and we're going to and we're going to put a little copyright symbol up there, you know, that forces them to say this news news story came from so and so. Doesn't work. So then you have to step back and say, okay, once we get over our ego, and we accept the fact that what has gone on forever is going to continue, and that is that they're going to rip off our stories and use them. But, but guess what? That's what's happening with a lot of the search engines. They're ripping off our stories and putting them out. Every place right. else is their own. Yeah. So you get past that and say, what do we do? Well, we step back and we, we, we th rethink our business. And you start with the basic point. We produce content. And content has value. People want content. If you look at what's going on, you still find a lot of people who are reading the news they may not necessarily be picking up the newspaper every day, but they're looking for news. And if you want to know news about where we live, there's one place you're going to find it. So we've got a brand that's been out there for 100 plus years. People know what to expect. And if you believe over time, which I do, that people are going to migrate back, there's this proliferation of information. They're going to come back to places that they feel over time that there's a confidence level in the information that's being provided. Mm -hmm. that's, to, that's to us or to any newspaper if you really think, you think it through and, you, and mm -hmm. you focus on this. So then what you do is say, let's talk about we're content providers. That's what we are. So you reconfigure the whole organization chart. You, you, know, you say, let's take off this first box that says print first. You sit down and say, I've got content. Where does it go first? Mm -hmm. And if you look at what we're doing now, it's going to go online. We then are going to use the newspaper where you can take a story and you can put a, a second day lead on it. You can provide more detail than you're going to get anyplace else. But then also I can take that same story and I can start thinking about one of the things I share with you. We're going to start a radio broadcast. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know the Washington Post has done this, but if I've, got, if I've already got the content, if I've got tapes that we're, where we've recorded people, then I'll, I'm going to go out and hire a broadcast person to work at a newspaper. 
It's like, my gosh, you know, these are the people that steal our stuff. Well, no, we've got mm -hmm. it now. We can go and, and work the same information and fill a void that no longer exists in our local markets. Mm -hmm. And that is local radio news is no more. It's gone. Talk radio doesn't give local news. It's just a lot of talking heads. But you cannot go any place in Chattanooga and, uh -huh. and, and, and get local news like you used to be able to get 15, 20 years ago. Uh -huh. So we're going to take this content. We're going to put up a morning broadcast. We're going to put up a, a late afternoon broadcast. It's got the final you know, bell of the stock and all this. Put, put interviews, put, you know, pull sound bites off. Have somebody who knows how to write radio copy. Put that up as a as a podcast. You know, you can get it off our you know, website. Uh, you know, however you want to receive it. I know because we've already sold sponsorships for this. Mm -hmm. And then if it works, then we'll turn around. We'll do it. We're going to do a sports program, similar type thing. So all we're thinking about is is and and and, and it is what we talk about. I think ten years later, I've got a better feel for what convergence means. Now, I'm also going to tell you mm -hmm. that I don't think many uh, communication journalism programs teach it yet. Because mm -hmm. uh, what I find, the University of Tennessee, they would say, you don't want to go into newspapers anymore because they're dying. So go mm -hmm. off and become a magazine person. Well, last time I looked at magazines, they're sort of struggling too. Uh, and, why, and so all of a sudden, it's, uh, I put out a, a, requ a request a couple weeks ago. I said, I want to hire a broadcast person to work in a newspaper. And I get this, why would you do that? I said, because if you think about what we do, what we offer, then we have an ability to take it and spread it across an array of platforms. Mm -hmm. And what I haven't created is gone out and built a brand new building where I've got a little team that sits here that does internet a team that sits here that does broadcast, a team that sits here and does newspaper, does print. Mm -hmm. And then they all three sit at a table, Martha, and they fight over who's going to put it on first. Because mm -hmm. the newspaper person says, this is my story, it ought to be in print first, so I don't want it out here. Uh -huh. you know, nobody's going to see it. What you do is you bring them all together as one in one entity, and you think through and say, I've got a story, and I can now take it and tell it in different ways. We're working a project right now. And again, we're not doing things that much different than you'll find at other newspapers and other news organizations. We're doing a multimedia package right now as a first step into this. And when it comes out, we're going to offer print, audio, still, and video. Mm -hmm. And we're going to tell the whole thing. We're going to learn from it. And we're going to say, okay, we know now better how to do this, but we're not going to necessarily go out and start and become you know, video camera people uh, my still photographers don't necessarily do that, but if I can, if we can see how it all works, then we can probably team up with somebody who does have that skill mm -hmm. and attach them to a story. So what I'm, what I'm now doing is I'm giving you, you know, film, mm -hmm. giving you TV, radio, and print, all in one package in one place, with the same story. And it's all being put together at one time. Mm -hmm. That's where I think it, that's how I think it all finally evolves. And it doesn't mean that TV stations are going away or anything like this. Uh -huh. What it does mean is that the, if you are smart enough and you have content, content will sell mm -hmm. years ahead. And we've got to be willing to say, do I believe people still read print products? Yes, I do. But I wanted to offer it to you and to that person I don't know today who's out there in the way that you'd like to receive it. Mm -hmm. But I want you to know it's coming from me. And if we're smart enough, we know how to sell that and the revenues there that supports that core group, uh -huh. those journalists that produce, that, that are important to remain in place over time. Mm -hmm. That's where it all starts. And so does it depend on advertising in each of those segments? Or it, it, it does, it, it, but it also depends. Well, for example, when we started, pod, we've got two podcasts up right now. We sold them before they went up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so part of it is it's the advertising people also have to rethink how they go out and sell something. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, all, sure. that's also part of this. Is it's very different to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out now and I'm going to offer you this, this, this audio broadcast once a week. We do one, it's on entertainment. But it's local entertainment in our market. 
uh, interviewing you know, local bands and offering music that you can download, things like this. Uh, and you've got to be smart enough to know, okay, I'm offering this. Now, who are the natural people that you would talk to to advertise? And I'm going to show you the demographic I'm going after. Mm -hmm. And I can come back and show you because they, they, you know, they go in and they, they link into this so they get it every week. It's rethinking it very different than saying, I've, I've got a product that, that I can tell you this many people see it, which mm -hmm. is a print product, versus I'm, I'm trying to walk you through you know, a very different way. So advertising people also have to be brought along, and they have to rethink you know, how they make their money, how they make their commissions. Because uh, a lot of them are a little re reluctant to sell a, an internet piece because it's, it's very fluid. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it is harder to quantify uh, you know, the, the eyeballs there than it is you know, being able to say, you know, here's an audited survey uh, on your circulation. But, mm -hmm. you, but you can make it work. Uh, I mean, what we have seen since we, since we moved to a much more aggressive internet strategy, uh, our unique visitors and page views have just, and then they've gone up about 25% every month since we moved in this new direction. Uh -huh. And so, so we know the content works. Now you've got to be smart enough to know how to monetize it. Now, do you, um, uh, do you work with local television? We work with local television on weather. Uh -huh. uh, but what I found is that we're further ahead than uh, local television with what we're doing, uh -huh. which... I mean, and and not just in, not in terms of just how gathering the content. We're 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 ahead of local television in our market in terms of some of the management and personnel issues. Because mm -hmm. I mean, it is it is very. You basically are telling people or bring trying to bring not telling you're trying to bring them along with you uh, to understand that we need to do this. You still got a great job. We're just going to ask you to rethink how you do what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, for example, when when reporters come back now, we you know, it, it think about it like it being a wire you know, a wire service. We're putting out a quick update, which maybe is thirty to sixty words, mm -hmm. that that goes out. But it's part of the process of time management. What you what you're doing is rather than coming back and sitting for an hour or two, you know, doing whatever, you sit down, you get organized real quick, you write a short, very short. You know, summary of your story that gets posted on the website, but it, it's it's your beginning of organizing your thoughts of the story you want to tell. Uh, I mean, and so that part was once we got to that, because the first question I got was, "You're asking me to do more, but you're not going to pay me more." Mm -hmm. I said, "Well, you're right on the second part at this point, but we will we will pay for you know." for the quality of what we get. I mean, we're not going to starve people at all. But uh, what we're saying is, it's managing your time. And sure enough, that's what happened. Now, the radio piece, the reason I'm going outside, that's a much different proposition because that, that's much more work intensive. So that's why I'm bringing somebody new in to do that mm -hmm. because uh, that really would have changed. I mean, if I've got a reporter on deadline and they've got an audio tape uh, and they've got to make a choice, they're going yeah. to choose to get the story done that's getting ready to go in print right. versus sitting there and fiddling around trying to find the interview that, that, that they did with you, and it may be somewhere in this 45-minute take. Yeah. Um, and so that's why we, we did go out and bring, you know, or looking for somebody new to come in and do that. When you look at, um, uh, through your whole career, the uh, kind of information that people get about the operation of government, and that's dealing with the government itself, what kind of information it, is, uh, it does um, provide that it allows to be pried out, um, but also what news organizations give to the public. Um, do you think that there is, uh, is a golden age of, um, of information? And if so, when? Well, th th let me make one other point to your question. The, the other thing I find which is a little disquieting is uh, a, a lot of people <clears throat> get turned off and tuned out on the the latest political story. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they really don't want to know that much about you know the ins and outs of immigration reform. I mean, uh, it's, you know, 
somebody will do a story that in 1986, when Senator Simpson and Senator Kennedy uh, passed the last immigration reform, that what didn't, we, we are now seeing play out what didn't get cleaned up in 1986. Mm -hmm. This is, this, the, the issues of today are, are, are left over from the 86 Immigration Act and, and trying to deal with, you know, do we have you know, illegal immigrants who ought to be in this country? Should they be sent back? What do we do about the borders? I mean, these were issues back in 86. Mm -hmm. But to get into this, psst, yeah, you might be the same. I mean, when, when I, Senator Baker w w came, when he and I spent some time together last week with Senator Kassebaum, who, you know, who is Mrs. Baker now, the three of us were talking about, because they, you know, they both were around and seeing that debate uh, mm -hmm. when it was occurring, and we're talking about and remembering the 86 issues that, that clearly at the time you wanted to pass something, but you knew uh -huh. that you hadn't done the whole job, and we're, we're seeing now. But to get people to say, boy, I want to write about this, and it, Mm -hmm. It is hard to get that story done. If somebody says this is a process story, I really don't care. Uh -huh. You know, and and when you see the biggest story uh, two days ago was Anna Nicole Smith being able to go forward with with her her, her case, uh, mm -hmm. and somebody we were sitting in our news budget meeting, and my wire editor had it down there as the last subject matter, and he said, "Well, a lot of people be interested in this." I said, "Well, then they can find it." And we put it inside the paper, but I'm not going to put this on the front page of my newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, because I said, you know, I mean, there, there's, there was a lot of other, you know, other things going on. One, of the, we, We've got to find a way to make issues of, of government, both local and state and national, of importance that people want to read them. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that's, you know, it's it's you know, that's that's a concern I've got, Martha. Is that we have allowed that to happen, and uh, you know, because what 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 readers will tell you is, boy, I, I read I don't, those stories are boring. I don't really care if you give me another budget story, I'm going to just you know get turned off. Uh, we deal with this for local school budget stories, uh -huh. which can be really just tedious, and or, or the latest test scores. That come out mm -hmm. on, on how students are doing, and so you want to say, yeah, the the numbers themselves can be, but you can tell there's a lot of stories if you dig underneath that mm -hmm. and start talking about what these numbers mean, yeah. and and that's what I hope we find, you know, that you know, that, that there's more interest in telling in in, in in looking at stories and finding that nugget that gets people brought into them, uh, that uh, you know. I, to your to your question, if you, I, I think the the nature and character of how people feel about uh, about you know, politics and politicians uh, is reflected in in the way information is provided to them. I mean, it's I mean, when you are caught up. And everything being partisan, mm -hmm. and and stark lines being drawn, that uh, then the tendency is you shy away from those stories. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you, you don't want you deal with them. I, I I was you know one of the issues in the Senate race in Tennessee this year is whether one of the candidates is uh, when he ran against Bill Frist in 1994 was he pro-life or pro-choice. Mm -hmm. And I went back and looked at a book Senator Baker wrote prior to his running for president in 1980, and it was talking then about the abortion issue. Mm -hmm. I said, now, this is an issue that's been out there for, for a long time, but is the most important issue you know, of a nuance between whether you were pro-choice, pro-life. Some people disagree with me on this. I said, I think I'd rather have somebody saying, let's go back and talk about the situation with gas prices and why have we not, you know, why have we not spent the money, done the things necessarily necessary to have the investments, or have we made investments? What is it, and why are we going to do anything different this time that we didn't do 20 or 30 years ago? Mm -hmm. uh, that's an issue that people, I think, really understand. Except I can draw stark contrasts and divisions among people if I keep talking about abortion, because I can overshadow an mm -hmm. issue like, are we really serious about? trying to find our way through 
in you know a dependence on foreign fuel supplies. Mm -hmm. I mean, and 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 you know it, it's that to me is is part of what I think we're missing right now, mm -hmm. and don't find the desire for people to go out and really work those stories. Uh huh. Let's go to some questions. Towson. Given the troubles that the Bush administration is going through at the moment, uh, do you see any parallels between Iran-Contra and the current situation with the Bush administration? And what do you believe George Bush can do to pull out his poll numbers and uh, have a, at least a successful ending to his administration? All right, that's a good question. I, d I don't think there's any parallel between when we went in with, with President Reagan. I mean, I, I talked to Senator Baker about this several weeks ago uh, when he got a... a, a called to do a program uh, at the time that the, that the chairs were getting ready to be changed uh, on the deck uh, and bring in, in, in Bolton with Card going out. And of course the point being was if you bring Howard Baker in, you get the, the connotation that it's all about uh, you know, a political scandal, which is what Iran-Contra was. Uh, this president is dealing with, with issues and, and I think management type uh, questions which we've talked about earlier it's not so much of a political scandal a la uh, Iran-Contra. Now, we, we consider, you, you, and you can point to, well, you, you've had the questions about, uh, about leaks and, and wiretappings and things like this, but they haven't raised themselves to the level that Iran-Contra raised mm -hmm. itself, where you, where you had a very serious time of, 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 of looking at whether the president the potential is going to be impeached over things like that. So that to me is, is a separation point between a, a political uh, a set of, a political dynamics, political scandal that prompted the uh, Don Regan going out and Senator Baker come in to the changes here. I think what you have in this case is uh, I, I think it's important after a period of time that you need some fresh faces, some fresh ideas, some fresh thoughts. The White House is a tough place to work. I mean, I tell people this day, it is the hardest job I ever had. And I was in there for, for you know, about two years. Uh, it is living in a fishbowl. Uh, I mean, it, it is realizing that, that how you show up to work, whether you're smiling or not, people read nuances into that. Your secretary can become a, a potential uh, source of information. And again, if your secretary you know, leaves all distraught, then they think, well, something must be happening. I mean, it is such a pressure cooker. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and at some point, you need to be able to step out and to bring fresh thoughts in. So I, I, I think it's appropriate. I was somewhat, to have to tell you the truth, amazed that some of these people have been there for six years. That's a mm -hmm. long time uh, you know, for some of these people. Not, not Scott McClellan, who clearly you had to have some changes in the press secretary's role, but, but in the case of Andy Card, he'd been there from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, now, what does it take to, uh, to, to back in your question, can President Bush's numbers bounce back? Um, I, think his, I think his presidency is now tied to a set of circumstances that are uh, outside of this country. They're in, in Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they chose to go in. Uh, uh, you can step back and say, you know, <clears throat> uh, uh, they may, they may, the shock and awe that was there may be the, the phrase that they're trying to, to, to define, you know, as they, as this administration winds down. What was the shock and awe? Uh, you know, and was part of the shock and awe what they were dealing with as administration. I worried, and this is somebody, I'm speaking now, not as a, not in my position as, as a newspaper editor and publisher. Uh, but having been in government, have been around government, uh, that, that the Defense Department fights wars. That's what they're there for. But I don't necessarily think the Defense Department goes in and sets up the next government. And when you saw that the that a shadow government was set up and basically being managed by, uh, uh, you know, out of the, by people involved in, in the Defense Department was a concern to me personally. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what the State Department does. Now, if you think the State Department are people who are a little squishy, uh, you know, then you ought, you ought to deal with that right up front, but uh, but then when you look at the at the shadow government that was was sort of sitting over there, you know, in either Roslyn or Crystal City, where it was they had them, uh, and and then once you know they they you know they overthrow 
uh, Saddam Hussein, and then you say, well, the guy that we had we thought we were going to put in to run the government, we think he may be a, sort of a bad guy. Mm -hmm. And so then we go in, we have his house raided. I mean, it's mm -hmm. things like that that, that, that you, you, you know, I mean, I think that, that, that Secretary Rice came close to several weeks ago where he said, look, uh, you know, not disagreeing with what we did, but we may have made a, you know, we may have had a few miscues mm -hmm. uh, that, that she was being honest about, it. sure. Uh, and then you, you sort of get a, a semi going to the woodshed routine, mm -hmm. but, uh, but sometimes honesty is important telling people, look, uh, we're there, this is why we're there, we think it's important why we're there, uh, could we have done some things different? Yeah, because in a war things change. I mean, the, the tactics on a, on a field change as you go through it. Um, and that's so my answer to your question is, uh, I, think, I think how, I think the Iraq war, how it plays out is going to shape this presidency. Uh, and, and it may be that this presidency doesn't get totally shaped until it's over and the next president is in the White House and we see how all this ends up. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's what's there. Uh, it's hard to imagine that this country uh, is going to get, I mean, we talked about this earlier, really get, get you know, <clears throat> focused and worried about Social Security reform uh, when, you're, you know, when you're fighting a war in Iraq. Because I think that's, uh, I mean, that's where a lot of the energy, resources, and money is going right now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and you can't ignore that. And I think, I think the war in Iraq has a lot of broader ramifications than just you know, what's going on in that country. We're seeing it play out a little bit. I think in terms of energy policy, I think we're seeing it term, uh, play out in terms of just our, our, our relationships, uh, uh, you know, on the world stage with other countries. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and so I think it is a very, uh, it, yeah. it's a very real, it's a very real issue, it's a very defining issue, and I think that that is part of what, uh, that, that this administration uh, has to figure out how they're going to manage it and deal with it. But it is, I think they're, I think they're tied into that. The question I've got is, is you know, what happens in November this year? I think it's going to be a fascinating election. I think it's a great one to cover. And mm -hmm. I'm happy to have the perspective I do mm -hmm. because I've got a, an open Senate race in Tennessee. Bill Frist's seat is up, and, and I think it's going to be a fascinating Senate race where uh, Congressman Harold Ford, a Democrat, uh, is running, and, and it's a very tough Republican primary in Tennessee right now. I think it's going to be one of the... Uh, the seats is going to be watched nationally as well. Mm -hmm. so I hope I answered your question as best yeah. I could. Right. Do you have a question? Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm intrigued by your convergence concept for a media company. Do you think that's a model that might be usable and adaptable to the White House in terms of the way that they communicate with the nation? Did y'all? Did they hear the question? Did y'all hear that question about convergence? Uh, yeah, he has a microphone, right? Do you? Oh, you didn't bring it. The question was, uh, after I talked to, we talked about convergence, could you see the, the convergence idea that, that I sort of laid out inside a news organization uh, working inside a White House? And I think the answer to the question is yes, mm -hmm. but I think Martha touched on it earlier that, uh, that the, the, the Clinton team, uh, whether, whether you want to say it was a war room or whatever, I think they had, they had put together a lot of these pieces uh, and 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 had and had figured out how to to really communicate through a through a number of these devices that this administration they're still there but I don't think there is as you know interested in doing that uh, but yeah I mean what I'm talking I mean a, a White House is such a has such a powerful podium that they that they that they present information from that not to take it you just you know, sort of say it's a missed opportunity, but they could, you, you could take anything this president does and repackage it and put it out there, you know, in every one of these formats. Uh, I mean, think about a White House that says, all right, we're going to, we're going to have, we're going to blog ourselves all the time. And so we've got this policy issue coming out, and so we're going to have undersecretary so-and-so out here, and he's going to offer a blog that you can, you know, you can pick up, you can use, uh, you can interact. I mean, you talk about managing the story. I mean, it is, you're stepping right into how the, the, the medium is changing, and you're right there in the forefront. Uh, I mean, what would you, what would you think if, if 
one night that, that the President of the United States, rather than doing the stand-up press conference in the East Room of the White House, does an online news conference. I mean, he still manages the questions that come in, but here he's sitting at his desk in the Oval Office, so you can see him, and he's doing a news conference online. Uh, and now, you know, and d d what does that do for the broadcast people? I'm not sure, but I think there are ways to adapt everything that's going on and figure out how to use that because the, the impact, the reach, is going to be so much broader than it is today. And if part of what a White House does is you're trying to take that information and you're trying to sort of you know, funnel it you mm -hmm. know, and, and sort of manage it, well, this really this opens up a way to do that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, because all of a sudden I've now taken the the, the, the new ways that, that information gets put out there, and I've I've just I've put my stuff into that funnel, and I'm managing that funnel. I mean, it, it makes to me it makes a lot of sense to to do that because you can touch every place people get information, and you can do it just like that. I mean, I can sit there and put a podcast up real quick, so I've got the sound bites from the president that I want. And then, I mean, it's the whole, it's the whole no notion of Ronald Reagan talking about I'm going straight to the American people. I mean, you've gone right to him because you can put out this podcast and it is your excerpts. Now, you can choose to pick it up or not if you're the broadcast medium. But it doesn't matter if you've got a computer, you can go in and you can listen to the President of the United States podcast mm -hmm. right now. Well, you can, um, uh, the White House has a website that has uh, Scott's briefing mm -hmm. is you can get it as a transcript but you can also watch it live right. some days. Well, so let me tell you what we just did Martha. We, we do editorial boards and uh, we put up, uh, we tape them and as soon as it's over and all we do is take the file, we do not edit it. We take the file as it was, was created, move it over into an audio program and you can sit there, you can read our story but you can listen to every piece of that editorial board online mm -hmm. if you want to. Uh, I mean, I, I think it is, you know, that to me is, is where, you know, where you want, you know, where I think this is going. Uh -huh. uh, because what, what, I, what you were doing is we're bringing that, that listener inside the newsroom. Mm -hmm. You're sitting in that room with us because you're hearing the questions being asked, the intros as they get, when they're told, look, everything's on the record. I mean, you know, the whole nine yards, so it makes you feel like you're a participant. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I think people are looking for, and the tools are there. I mean, I mean for, 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 I, wait till we see the next campaign. Mm -hmm. I got to believe that, that, you know, whereas as Howard Dean was talking about, you know, he was the, the, the guy who did all the stuff on the Internet. We haven't seen anything with what you can do this mm -hmm. next time. I mean, you could sit there and, and, and be beaming out everything you're doing, and all of a sudden, I need TV commercials to do certain things, but I, boy, can I target, if I've got this list, and I know I'm going to talk about this topic, and so I'm going to send you this, say, you know, get on your computer right now and look at this, or I'm going to take this, this piece I did, and I'm going to email it out to you to a targeted base of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that to me is what this technology allows you to do. You can, and it is, it is relatively inexpensive when you do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, all we're, the cost to us yeah. is laying a, re, it's, it is a regular handheld digital recorder. It's all it is. Mm -hmm. Sitting on a table, mm -hmm. and it's one person going in, and it's a piece of software sitting on a Mac G5, and it gets up, and that's all the expenses involved in it. Mm -hmm. I know that um, somebody was uh, telling me last week who was involved in, um, in campaign politics that there's a lot less money that is going to be spent on advertising right. because there's so many ways of getting there. Well, tell, one thing that uh, uh, tell us about is, as an editor, how do you feel the White House's presence? What kinds of things do, does the White House do to try to, uh, to get to your newspaper? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> nothing. And that's, been, that's just been amazing. Um, uh, if 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 I was there, and this is great because I consider I can be the Monday morning quarterback, knowing what the tools are available to me today, 
compared the tools that, that, that were there when we were in the White House in 87, 88. I could, you know, if I'm, if I'm looking at, let's take CAFTA, for example. We have some hosiery mills down in Fort Payne, Alabama that were really worried about what was going to happen to them with CAFTA mm -hmm. and with jobs and, and with, you know, with socks and things that were going to go then, uh, you know, out of their plant in, in Fort Payne, Alabama, down to Central America. Why would I not have said, well, we're monitoring this because it's easy to monitor, not hard at all. And so we're going to, we're going to say, we've got so-and-so and this person in the administration, we want to come in, we're going to give you an opportunity to talk to them directly. Now, I've got a Washington correspondence, one thing, but we can do it. Can you all take it online? Because we can do an online news you know, event for you. And the answer is yes, we can. Uh, and, I, and I bring that, I bring that, you know, expert in, uh, I mean, whoever it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, there is still a lot of glamour when somebody says, wow, guess what? You know, so-and-so with the White House, you know, talked to me today. I mean, and it, it is important. I, I'm not yeah. trying to denigrate that. Uh, although it was amazing to me in the White House to see some people who, who would love to have a White House operator place to call because they knew that whoever's on the other end would take it get, it's the White House calling. And that was their thrill for the day. And so we'll enjoy it while you can, because when you get out here, they're not going to talk to you for one minute. But you're just, but <laughs> mm -hmm. anyway, but the White House, the persona of the White House is very important. But to be able to take that and target it in mm -hmm. and focus it, uh, if I've got the majority of the United States Senate <clears throat> from Tennessee, which he is, and there's some issues working, and I want to come in and say, boy, I bet you if, if I can come in and, 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 and make certain people available, and we can move a story. And it's almost like an exclusive. Mm -hmm. It's a very different exclusive. You know, when we were talking earlier about, uh, about the White, White House press corps, why it's important, but the White House has the ability to get past that if they want to take it. And they want to come in and talk directly to us. Mm -hmm. Then, I mean, the technology allows you to do that. It doesn't get done. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I mean, it, it's it's they're missed opportunities in my mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you you really would like to be able to sit back and and say I can I can manage an issue, I can manage a message, I can figure out you know something that really is important to your your readers, and I can target it in, and and give you certain people to do it. I mean, it's out there. It, it doesn't. It happened. I wasn't being flipped when I said absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 it it's missed opportunities. Uh, mm -hmm. In my mind, mm -hmm. but uh, but you got to be willing. You know, I, I think you have to have a different, a, a whole different media strategy mm -hmm. uh, that you want to. You know, it, it's it, while well, I, well, I hope Tony Snow is successful. It is more than changing the spokesperson. Mm -hmm. It is changing the way you approach issues, the way you present your information. I mean, uh, a spokesperson is is just that. A spokesperson is is talking about issues that are out there that are in you know out there in the public domain. The spokesperson doesn't all sense. Okay, guess what? We now are no longer going to talk about Iraq. Mm -hmm. Can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of it is, do you also then rethink your, your approach? But also, do you look at what are your what are the policy options? And not saying go out and change them, but 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 Figure out what is it that you're trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. But if it's just I'm changing chairs, mm -hmm. it's not going to have an impact. I have to think that um, ultimately it's a question of persuading the president that, um, uh, that more needs to be done in terms of uh, explaining things to people. Uh, y y yes. I mean, that is part of it. But, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you do go back and say he was elected and you were not. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, part of our goal, you know, when we sat down with President Reagan, one of the toughest conversations we've had was at the end of Rand Contra walking in after he had written, I've told you this story, he had written out in longhand on three l legal sized yellow pages what he wanted to say as the final words of Rand Contra. Mm -hmm. And once more, he wanted to go back and explain that I didn't trade arms for hostages and go through 
uh, what we call the triangulation theory. Mm -hmm. You know, I did this happened, which caused this, which caused this, which was so convoluted nobody understood it. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get there. And so we sat down, and, and, he, and he read this speech. We were sitting up in the, in, the, in, in the family quarters of the White House. He read this speech. And Senator Baker turned to him and said, Mr. President, it's a great speech. You can't give it. And he said, here's what we've got to say. And what he did say, if you go back and look at it, was, you know, the buck stopped here, mistakes were made, it's time to, you know, da-da-da. said that, and the issue was over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he, he said that, um, that he really believed that, um, uh, that he hadn't done That's anything. Right. But then the facts seemed to, uh, to say otherwise. That's and then he, went, then he went on. And it's, it's very, uh, yeah, it was very interesting. <laughs> but, 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 but he that, said that he had done it. Yeah, but, yeah. but that's what you have to do. Right. But, but if, if President Reagan had wanted to say, no, nope, one more time I'm going to try to convince people I didn't do this, which, which caused that, then he was the president. He could have said it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's, you know, that's, but yeah, what you hope, what you hope is that, that, that in addition to some new players, that I have no, I have no sense, Martha, I'm just be very honest about it, of what advice and counsel this president receives. I've got to assume it's pretty good. But I hope that part of what, what is the change means that there's, other, you know, other voices that are going to be mm -hmm. at the table. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that one of the things that I find, and it isn't just in a White House, I mean, I've, I've seen it recently in Chattanooga, is that uh, anybody who serves in an elected position needs to have somebody that's the contrarian. Mm -hmm. That will sit there and say, I, you know, I hear you, but let me, I want to make sure that you have this point of view as well. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the person's going to decide what they want to say and do. But, they, but you need that balance point, and you got to be willing. I mean, part of what I did for Senator Baker, I've served part of that role for him. And I would, I mean, he would get angry with me at times in his own way. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, several hours later or whatever, he might come back and say, you know, uh, I didn't like that, you know, what, you know, what you shared with me, but... But yeah, yeah, it sort of made sense, and we ought to do such and such. Uh, but that's part of the job, mm -hmm. is you've got to be willing to, to lay out the range of options and have a tough enough skin that you can get it taken off every now and then. Mm -hmm. But somebody's got to do that. <laughs> yeah. uh, because there's too many people in government who are yes people. Mm -hmm. they, want to, they want to sort of put the finger up and sort of give, what does the person want to hear? Uh, that's important, but you also got to have the people who put up the finger also and said, but I also got to make sure you get the full spectrum of what's there mm -hmm. so you know everything that's going on and, but as you make that choice and make that decision. Mm -hmm. Towson, you got a question? Um, coming, coming from the uh, journalist perspective and also as a former White House communications official, uh, what do you think that Tony Snow brings to this job as uh, press secretary, and do you think he should be involved in policy making? And what does he also bring to journalists? Good question, and it's something that that Martha and I talked about before before we, we started this. So let me sort of knock them off for you. I, I think I knock them off for you pretty quick. Number one, uh, I think that when when the press secretary makes a point that I'm going to be, have asked to be, and been assured I will be part of the policy-making process, that you need to understand what that means. When we went in, uh, Marlon Fitzwater, who was a good press secretary, there were times where he did not want to be in that room when everything was being ironed out. Because you've got to be able to tell and answer credibly when the press presses you on, when you're up at that podium, did you know such and such? Do you know this or that? And there is a fine line between being credible and lying. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> you've got to really walk that line carefully. So if you make a point to say, I was sitting in that room 
when that decision was made and they ask you a question and you sit there and say, I do not know, mm -hmm. then your credibility is in question. So I think he's got to find out where, you know, where that balance point is uh, and how to do, because the, the, the two parts of that work against each other. I mean, we were, we were talking again before, before we started uh, that when Larry Speaks was, was in the White House uh, in the Reagan, first Reagan administration and the Grenada launch happened and he got asked a question, he basically misled the media. Mm -hmm. And he got really, really mm -hmm. criticized for it, uh, and and because it, it, it sort of got acknowledged that, that he knew and he would he purposely had sort of misled him, uh, and 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 so I think I mean I think for Tony Snow it's admirable he wants to be part of the party as a communication director in the White House. I was not that person that stood behind that podium. I was much more involved in a lot of these decisions. But my job was to sit down and figure out how you communicated it, you used the various levers in the White House, uh, how you would go out and do events and things wrapped around it, what the president was going to say if you had a Rose Garden event. I did not have to stand in front of the media and, and ask the question, do you know such and such? That's a very, that's a, uh, that, that is a real uh, a sticky wicket. Number two, uh, uh, it is also very important for Tony Snow to know as he goes in that he is no longer a working journalist, he is now a spokesperson for the White House. And that relationships that he has, and that are important relationships to him, whether it's with Fox News or anybody else in the media, they're very different that first day he stands behind that platform. And that, that this journalist who, is, who may be his longtime friend when he asks a question or if they're out someplace uh, having lunch and he asks him something and if he volunteers something and it appears uh, on TV that night or appears in a, in a wire account or something and he says, my gosh, I thought this was off the record, that person says, but you didn't tell me that. I mean, one of the, one of the first rules is, and, and I say this to my reporters in the newsroom today, when you talk to somebody, you make sure they, you understand, they understand how they're talking to you. So that if it, it is well understood, what does off the record mean? What does on background mean? All these little phrases, which are in the eye of the beholder, mean something different. That a Tony Snow's got to make sure that if he's sitting down with Britt Hume, the first day he's on that job at lunch, he says, Britt, you're my friend. How are we talking? And if Britt Hume says to him, all this is off the record, fine. But if he says, well, then you better, your antenna better go up. Because you now are a source of information and you're in a competitive game and everybody's chasing to be first. That's one of the other things the Internet has caused. Everybody wants to be first. Sometimes the facts are left behind right. a little bit as they're being first. Uh, but that, that to me is a second part of this, is understanding relationships that he has had before and that those relationships are very different now uh, and that he is talking to people in a very different way. Uh, there was a third part to your question. Uh, can you remind me of the third? I know I hit two of them. <laughs> uh, what will he bring the journalists? Thank you. Uh, I, th I hope what he brings is a, as an outsider, uh, that he is able to help with inside the administration uh, to understand how you can work with the media. Uh, and the media, it, while it's adversarial, it does not necessarily have to be uh, uh, combative all the time. And if he can bring that in and be, a, be more of a voice for uh, how to work with, with the media, then I think that's a plus. And, he, and, I, and I hope he brings it because he's been out there, uh, you know, uh, as a working journalist, a, a journalist who's written about this White House, uh, who shares some, some fairly pointed uh, commentary about this White House, uh, and, and, and I, I, I hope that that's listened to, if not. But these are things that have to have been nailed down before he took the job. Mm -hmm. And I have to trust he nailed them down. Because once you get in the job, you can't do it. One of the, one of the 
one of the most telling stories is if you look back in the early days of the Ford administration when he came in after President Nixon resigned and Gerald Terhorst came in as his press secretary. Gerald Terhorst, who had been with the Detroit News, if I remember right, or the Free Press, right, I think it was yeah. Detroit News, and he gets brought in and all of a sudden, I don't remember what the, what the issue, I think it was about it was the pardon, pardon of Richard Nixon. Right. right. And uh, all of a sudden there's a big falling out and there's a big to-do because he resigns. And that told me right there, and, and I think it's a great lesson learned, you, you need to have these understandings before you get in there. Because once you're there, it's a whole different world. And I hope he's nailed these down. And, you're, and the last part is one of them that I hope's nailed down. Well, thank you very much. Thank I you appreciate all. appreciate it. Your position inside the White House where all this comes together. Uh, it does rise to the top because here's the President of the United States you expect that he will know. Uh, but there are so many different people and players that uh, if you're, I mean, what it told me was that the, that the way the White House was set up to operate, there was, you know, there were a couple missing pieces. So you needed to, you know, somebody needed to come in and sort of look at that and decide at the end of the day, you know, you could at least say that, that there was an awareness inside the White House before that decision yeah. got made. Because you know, we just had, you know, a, a decision, what, within the last week where this time the president actually looked at. So somebody yeah. got the message uh, that you, you have to be able, you know, and because in, in our, in the White House when we were in there, there was a staff secretary, and that was staff, staff secretary's job, move paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was, there was paper that got moved that got to, you know, to a certain level where within the White House you knew what was going on. And, uh, and but that was one of the breakdowns that I saw. Yeah. Uh, was right. that that there, there were some things just really not functioning. And it isn't a matter of, of what I'll call of control. It's a matter of needing to know uh, and making sure that that you know as a decision like this, which was a fairly uh, sensitive decision, had a lot of of, of uh, you know, potential security you know ramifications, but also had a congressional you know a real congressional. Sure. Uh, piece to it yeah. uh, that, that the systems had broken down. Yeah, um, I kind of wonder if if one of the things that um, that was at the back of it in this administration, the system that Card uh, wanted to set up was a compartmentalized system where everybody had their job that they would have a responsibility to do to do X and Y, and so they took care of that particular part. Right. But that the integration of all of it was. Um, uh, was lacking in in some times uh, because there were times, for example, when um, when you'd have um, an economist uh, come out and say, uh, like the, um, uh, the guy who was the Council of Economic Advisors, head of the Council of Economic Advisors, who was saying that um, outsourcing really you know worked pretty well, and so that report, I mean, you could say <laughs> you probably have to rephrase that. And uh, right. so say in the Clinton administration, you had, <clears throat> as I guess most Democratic administrations, a lot of redundancy. I mean, you just had so many people involved in everything. But the result of it was that, um, that people had a little more political sensitivity of when they were going to run into trouble. And so the economic reports were always run through them. Uh, yeah, it, it, but you know, for an for administration that really has has tried to sort of clamp down on on who can speak and and leaks and things like this, uh, for it to have had as many you know <clears throat> sort of what I'll call bumbling episodes, uh, it, it, you want to ask the question: Were you so focused on on shutting off the spigot that you didn't worry about just the basics of how information gets you know? gets disseminated. Right. I mean, when, when, when we went inside the, the Reagan White House, uh, you know, it wasn't that, that, that things were out of control necessarily. Uh, and Social Security was in trouble. Mm -hmm. And number two, they thought that the, um, the retirement accounts would be a good idea. And the two, I mean, right from the start in the briefing room, reporters uh, pointed out that one didn't relate to the other right and how how can you sell these two things together and um, and they just hung with it no matter what and if you look at the polls that the support for it was less I mean, it was 60 60 cities in 60 days although it was kind of like 600 cities because uh, they right. sent out so many people but by the end the support was less than when they began 
Well, and, and you know, we, we were talking you know, earlier about uh, making sure that people inside a newsroom understand context and history. Uh, this administration is in the middle of a war. And we really haven't had a country in the middle of a war. I mean, the, the skirmishes that went on with the Reagan administration, things like this, that's what they were. But we haven't been at war since Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was fascinating inside my newsroom to look at young people for the first time in, what, 30 years who were all of a sudden, uh, you know, talking about their colleagues, their friends in college who had gotten into the National Guard as a way to pay, pay their way right. through college. Now all yeah. of a sudden, yeah. my gosh, they're getting called up. They had never in their wildest dreams ever thought that they yeah. would actually serve. And uh, we had this, we, we, when, 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 when the Iraq War was getting ready to start, we had a, a meeting uh, of our news staff and uh, to talk about covering a war. I mean, we did embed a reporter in Iraq for six months. But just some of the stories and things we're going to do as a, as a uh -huh. startup with reporters who knew nothing about the, the various branches of government and the difference in, 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 in insignias and ranks among the various branches. So we had this conversation. This is a room with about 50 people in it, and there were three people in that room, including myself, who'd ever served in the military. Mm. Now, and I've got a room full of baby boomers, like most newspapers are going to have. And then you sort of bring it back from that. And I was startled to realize that in this room, that I've got people who are getting ready to cover something, most of whom have no context for any, you know, understanding the military, how it works, yeah. uh, these type things. So you, you take that and then say, all right, here's an administration now that is in the middle of trying to steer and direct a policy at the time we're back at war. And you want to say, I wonder if they spent any time understanding, mm -hmm. going back and looking at what was happening during the Kennedy administration, mm -hmm. Johnson, uh, Nixon, a country at war. What was different? Could you get people focused on other things than worrying about you know, what's uh -huh. going on in that case in Vietnam, now it's worrying about what's going on in Iraq, uh, and how do you yeah. sort of put that in context at the same time you deal with other issues? Now, one of the advantages, this administration right now has got an economy that is, you know, a White House or Congress gets ready to act on something. Shouldn't you be telling the whole story? And, and part of that, I said, comes from the experience that I had in government. Uh, now, when you go back then, uh, let me take the first part of your question. I think the most difficult part, and one of the things that we were talking about briefly uh, with Tony Snow getting ready to come in as the new spokesman at the White House, is you have to understand there is a very, it's a very different world when you're a reporter looking in than when you're a spokesperson looking out. Mm -hmm. And some of the very same people that Tony Snow has worked with you know, as a commentator uh, at Fox News are now adversaries, not necessarily in a bad sense, but they're out trying to tell stories. Mm -hmm. uh, and so relationships change. Mm -hmm. uh, and what a Tony Snow is trying to do is to, you know, is, is to take a set of facts and present them from the administration's point of view. You're an advocate now. Uh, you know, you, you've, got a, you've got to sort of take a, a set of situations and try to pitch them as best you can. And the balance that he's got now, I think any good press secretary has got to understand or communication person who, mm -hmm. you know, inside a White House, is where does your credibility start and stop? Yeah. I mean, we went in during Iran-Contra, and we had some clear understandings of, of, of would we ever go to a point where you knowingly told a lie? And the answer was no. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's why today, you know, you know I, I can sit here today, and you and I have had this conversation before, and say at no point... Uh, in my career, which was, as you said, was in the, in the Senate and then in the White House, did I knowingly put out information that was not credible or was not factual. Uh, and because at the end of the day, all you have is really your own, your own reputation. Right. And whether that matters or not, it should. And then you have to decide if it gets to the point of whether, you know, if you know there's information you've been given that's not accurate. Do you put it out or do you say, I can't do that? Because then you have a choice. 
And I think the choice isn't that you go out and scream and get yourself in the media. The choice is that you decide that, you know, I'm going to go do something else. Uh, you know, but just because I, I, you know, I can't uh -huh. deal with that, I'm not going to put out something I know is false. But what responsibilities do you, do, do you have, as, say, as a communications director or as a press secretary, to dig down and find out what the facts are? Because it's very difficult to do. You just, you know, if you talk to a public affairs person, which, you know, they have regular calls with public affairs people, and they're going to always give the rosy picture. Right. And so how do you dig into the bureaucracy and make sure that you're getting what you need to get? Well, that is hard, because if you're in the White House, I mean, I watched the, the, the story developed about, the, uh, uh, about turning over the ports uh, right. and the port security yeah. to, to uh, you know, a company in Dubai. And uh, I kept waiting for somebody in right. the White House to say it was vetted, but if it, if it, there are so many different interagencies that touch a, a decision, and what it says is that the White House staff didn't function. Right. Because there is a coordinating... Um, this evening, we are very privileged to have Tom Griscom, who represents two worlds. Uh, he worked in the, in the high reaches of the Reagan administration, worked in the, uh, as a communications director, as the communications czar, and also worked in the Senate uh, for Senator Howard Baker, and is the editor and publisher of the Chattanooga Times. So you can really tell us how those two worlds intersect and what some of the pressures are of providing the public with the information that um, they need. In looking at your two positions, did you see information differently and what the public needs for information? Like when you were in the White House, how did you look at that question of what information the public needs and how do you look at it now? I want to, I want to reverse your question if you don't mind. Because sure. one of the anyway. things when I, when, I, uh, when I got back into journalism after, I mean, that's where I started when I graduated from college, uh, low many years ago. Uh, to come back into a newsroom uh, with people who had spent most of their time, you know, as journalists. That's what they had done. So they had all, they had a lot more experience mm -hmm. that way than maybe I had in knowing what the latest light, writing style were, things like this. But here's the point I made, Martha, at the time. I said, I wish there were more people in journalism who had done what I did. I mean, I'm a hybrid. I'm, you know, you don't usually find people like me mm -hmm. who are allowed to come back into the fraternity, per se, uh, but I wish I wish there was more uh, people like with the experience that I've I've had, because here's what you bring in, an understanding of how how policy works, how things get done, mm -hmm. uh, the pressures that are applied, uh, the special interests, all the things that that go in, and the fact that journalists get spun just as much as anybody else, they get leveraged by you know a phone mm -hmm. call. Uh, or somebody pushing a, a point of view, and I said, if, I said, if you can understand that, uh, that what happens with the way stories are told, mm -hmm. how you gather information, now you're going to sit there and think that nobody, you know, nobody influences me at all. And I said, let me tell you, I did. Mm -hmm. That used to be what I did. I will come to that in just a second. But I said, so step back and think about this. If you've, you've got a story that, that's being done about, uh, let's say, Bowwater, which is a company that's, that's down in our area. Uh, it's a paper manufacturer. And so you've got a lot of environmentalists that talk about what bow water uh -huh. does and, you know, in, in clear cutting things like this. Uh, and so you get this information and, and your, your natural tendency is you're going to run with that without checking the facts. And you're not going to necessarily tell readers who is this group that's put out this information? Who funds them? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the agenda that they have? Is it that's you ought to be just as focused on telling that part of the story. Let readers decide then, after they know, here's who this, this group is, mm -hmm. here's what Bowwaters does as a company, put all that information out there, because that is part of telling this story. I said, now, it's not that I'm so, so smart myself, but it's part of having watched how decisions get made, the influences come to bear as, you know, as a, mm -hmm. a uh, it, was un, it was really, Making sure that things were vetted and that you, there was some idea of what was getting ready to happen, when it was getting ready to happen, uh, and being able to, to manage that information flow. Uh, I mean, we, we, you know, we've talked about before that when we went in and, and that uh, then, you know, uh, Chief of Staff Don Regan had said, 
his mission was to let President Reagan be President Reagan, mm -hmm. uh, which meant just whatever he wanted to say and do, let him go do it. When in fact, if you really understood President Reagan, that uh, yeah, that the White House had been set up, even his governor's office in California was set up uh, the same way that he had been as an mm -hmm. actor. That he, here was his role, but he had always had people around him who you know who who were there to right. manage you know, things, you know, whether it was scripting or things like this. Uh, and when you took those away, that all of a sudden what happened is that you had similar to what I think we've seen a little bit in this in this White House mm -hmm. is things just sort of happening out here without somebody really understanding how to manage them, how to make sure it was all came you know came together, yeah. uh -huh. uh, and that you had a focus a focal point uh, on what you were doing. Um, and, and, and that to me is what was surprising, Martha, to watch a lot of what was happening here. I think you, uh -huh. I think you have, the way you describe what Andy Card was doing, he's a uh -huh. great guy, mm -hmm. really, really a, a, a really good person. But, uh, uh, but a White House staff is designed to make sure that there's no surprises. Yeah, I mean that's that was one of Senator Baker's rules from the beginning when we went to work with him. No surprises. You go have a latitude to do a lot of things, but at the end of the day, make sure uh -huh. that I'm not that there's not a surprise because something just fell through the cracks. Do you think that um, that there is an inherent problem when you're very focused on a message, and everybody's got their responsibilities uh, relating to that message and taking it out, that it becomes difficult to listen? Well, I, I'm not sure this administration has been that much focused on a message. I mean, there have been times, and I'm looking at it now as an outsider's newspaper you know, editor and publisher, of where you scratch your head trying to figure out, well, what are they really, what are they really doing this week? Uh, I mean, when the whole, you know, when when Congress and the country moved off of Social Security, and they still had the president out there talking about privatizing Social Security. Mm -hmm. Now. If I was going to be still have that message, we just had a, a, a report that just came out earlier this week about Medicare and Social Security still being on path to go bankrupt by, what, 2040. Uh -huh. Well, if, I, if that issue was important, then that, that'd be the time I'd be out there talking about it because you've got a hook to build it off of. But, but it's, it, was, it was watching it sort of getting a sense that was there really, was there really a message or were they just sort of out there you know, putting things up against the wall, uh, you know, and trying just to sort of go uh -huh. back to some some consistent themes, but themes that had that had so far passed on, you know, on right. through that you, yeah. know, you just wondered, you know, was there was there a real focus on this message? Right. I, I'm not sure. Because um, as they began, they talked about one.